You know, Jerry, when we went to France earlier this year, um, I said to you that the extraordinary gift that you have given me is um, the two of you coming from the evening like this. Remember what we were talking about this? And I said, um, this is the first book that I've published uh, after my father passed away. And having them here makes me feel uh, infinitely less often. And that's what I said to you. So I want to thank you for coming here as my spiritual elders and my extended family. But you know, JP, conversely, I'd ask you, why, why did you say yes? Why did you agree to come and grace an occasion by a novice writer? <laughs> Because you asked me. <laughs> <coughs> um, no, 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 please. Don't, don't, don't. There's a very famous uh, lyric that aptly describes my presence here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. A funny young man from the Clyde, on a funeral carriage was tied. When asked to his dad, he giggled and said, I don't know, I just came for the ride. There are many uh, repartees I could offer, but I shan't. I'm going to discontinue the door now. I'm thinking you grew up in a literary household. Um, your father, Dr. Hari Vanshaya Vanshan, was a legendary poet. What was it to grow up in a household of books? You kept away from his room. <laughs> and there was uh, an unwritten code of conduct in the family that when my father is writing in his study, he is not to be disturbed. Uh, many a times uh, we found that to be a little odd, but then mother would explain to us that uh, it's important for creative people and particularly the writers uh, to have their moment of solitude and to be able to express themselves. They needed the peace and harmony of a home to be able to do that. That was some of the early impressions that we had. Um, but as we grew up, um, there were many occasions when, uh, uh, if he was doing an important piece of work, um, I remember that uh, he was asked by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru to translate uh, a biography on him, written by Michael Brisha uh, into Hindi. And uh, there was a deadline that he had finished before, the, before his birthday. And he was working day and night, and he put out a little placard, almost like a painting outside the door of his studies. That meant that nobody was allowed to go in and disturb him. And this used to happen for you know days and days and days. We never really knew how he was or what he was doing. That's the kind of temperament that we grew up in. But yes, every time um, my father would um, write a piece of poem, uh, we were the first people that he would introduce the poem. And in particular, he would uh, ask us to read it in almost the same graph and the, and the tone that he had written. And I felt that that was an extremely important exercise. Because later on in my work as a professional actor, I found that um, the respect that we need to give writers is the most important aspect in filmmaking. I feel that writers are the most important ingredient in filmmaking. They, you know, design the character, they design the story, uh, they design the dress, the location, everything. And once they write, it's written with a lot of conviction and strength. And it's important to be able to gauge their mind and the graph of their language. 
before you actually say your lines. So some of the things that we learned, uh, what I learned from my father was to be able to be able to recite some of his works in the same graph and language. That I found very valuable. Other than that, of course, uh, the numerous uh, uh, people of letters that, that used to visit him and to be just sitting quietly and listening to them converse and, and discuss various aspects of life, poetry and literature was indeed a, a very revealing aspect. I remember when we were in Allahabad, uh, we, there was a, a union that was formed by the students that he was teaching. He was teaching English literature in, in Allahabad University. And they used to sit after midnight and discuss you know, words, literature, poems, writings. And many a times, even though we were not allowed to be awake at that point, we would sit up and just be present with them and listen to them. Those are some of the experiences that we grew up with. Well, what do you remember of those days, that time which was magical hour? Well, just, just the, uh, the concept of, uh, you know, picking each other's brains, um, writing, uh, somebody's <coughs> work used to be discussed, somebody's poem used to be discussed, why he wrote it, what was the intent, much like what you just described in your description of your book. Um, many people go through certain um, emotions or, or the need to write something and to be able to express it in verse is, is indeed a quality that we used to gather them. Judging your father, Dharam Kumar Badri, was a celebrated writer, making great books on the ground. Tell us about which of his books is your favorite. His first that was a travel note that he did, when he traveled around the world. It was very beautiful. And what about it that impacted you so Knowledge and uh, his observation, his take. Mm. That kind of independence. And did you read to your children or now? Do you read to your grandchildren? Absolutely. What do you read? Every night. Really? Uh, I have to tell you a story. Yeah. My granddaughter, that's my daughter's daughter, Nadia Nabi, when she was little, I used to make up stories every night. Hmm. And in Hindi, when you speak, Tell children some stories, you always say, Ek tha raja or Ek tira. Aise, aise, you know, because I heard my father-in-law also mm. saying this. And every day, I'd say, they'd get lost in a boat. Mm. The prince and the princess, the king would be worried, the queen would be crying. And I used to, every day, add a little bit. Uh, Fortunately, they didn't live with us. They would go back to Delhi, so I got some rest. The second child arrived. Now I had to tell a story to both of them. And I started telling the same story, uh, adding a little bit, and paying a little more attention to the prince as well. It used to be more the princess before. One night, and it used to be all in dark, and they were in these bunker beds. So the older one slept down and the younger one slept down. Mm. She just bent down a little. Nani, can we have a new story? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, poor child, she was patient for so long listening to my story. And she exactly knew. But when they're little, they love to hear the same thing. Mm. But I realized she'd grown up. So it was time to stop making stories and read the proper poetry books. And then I started reading. Oh, wonderful. What a great gift that you were able to give. Uh, Jimmy, also, you told me one thing ages ago that you know, the Bachchans are the most reluctant to part with the book. Why is that? I don't know. I mean, he's worse than me. <laughs> you know, you. Um, you go out to a bookstore 
Um, most of the time, uh, well, these days one doesn't have the opportunity to go to a bookstore in town. So it's mostly the airports when you're catching a flight. You have a bookstore and you rummage through all the bestsellers and you see the books. And you spend a lot of time before your flight in selecting a book. Then while you're in the plane, you, you start to read it. Uh, you make your little note on top of the first page, you write your name, you write the date you bought the book, uh, you, you write the shop that you got it from, the, the flight you're on, how long it's going to take for you to reach your destination, all these details are there on every front page of the book. I'm not going to part with that book. To see. <laughs> Kids are invited to birthday parties, and I remember, you know, kids would bring a box of Cadbury's chocolate or a box of uh, uh, cookies and things like that. Uh, when we were very little, that was fine. When we grew a little older, my father would always say, "Give a book; it remains on the shelf." Maybe not then, but sometime you pull it out and read it. That's more important than eating the biscuits and the chocolates. So this is something that I was used to. And it was my job in the house to every Sunday clean the bookshelves. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and I would sort of go through them. And it's such an interesting uh, activity and so when you've taken care when you've been <coughs> told and you've been brought up with books more than anything else even more than a piece of jewelry it's a little difficult to part with gifts now books so uh, but uh, sometimes I feel okay you've read it I want to I collect books and I send it to schools especially for the for their library and then I get to hear from the office oh, sahab ne pura wapas <laughs> <laughs> so it's futile exercise I mean, there is no place <laughs> in the shelves for the books and now they're on the floor <clears throat> you know I so can we stop this domestic conversation <laughs>
post button on the computer. From 5 o'clock in the morning, I start getting these uh, alarms. What happened to you, sir? Where's the blog? <laughs> you, you haven't pressed the, the right button. Yeah, do it right now. So it's, it's almost like a commitment. And, uh, but it's, it's really wonderful. Um, no matter what time I finish at night, um, most of the time it's very late, um, I do find time to write something. It's a moment, as you described uh, earlier on in your speech, of wanting to spend time with yourself, uh, to have your own solitude, and maybe just have an opportunity to talk to yourself. And if you can express that in words, uh, and if there are a few people that want to read it, it's just wonderful. It's not for any kind of personal gain, or uh, any kind of uh, commercial gain. It's just something that that comes out. I never know what I'm going to write until you actually open that blog post in front of you. And then suddenly everything starts happening. Uh, it could be anything. Just you know, uh, a review of the day's work, uh, uh, some issue that has troubled you, something that my father wrote, something that I wanted to express on that. You know, since I have a book out, um, and I've always turned to the two of you for advice. Can you speak a little louder? Sure. Would you like me to scream, Judge? <laughs> I'm happy to do so. As I have a book out, uh, can you please advise me on what is uh, the sensible way to deal with criticism? <laughs> Both of you. <laughs> Come on, Jamie. I'm sure you can be vaguely diplomatic for <clears throat> half a minute. I should try. By the way, my entire accomplishment of this entire evening is not the book or any of that. The fact that Jamie has not screamed at me in like 60 minutes is like a huge deal. So this, I won this show at this point in time. I'm the wrong person to answer. He's the one. He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. He the correct, sensible uh, response one can have to criticism. I don't actually care. <laughs> The first uh, assurance that you get is actually somebody's read your work. It's very important for, for us in the creative field because if nobody goes to see our film, that's uh, really bad. So that's one of the first things that comes to your mind. But but seriously, I, I would I would accept criticism. I would like to accept. Because I think it gives you um, an aspect of your work which you were not aware of. And there are many critics, I'm sure there are many here tonight, uh, who are able to have the perception of being able to go beyond what you've written or have a different viewpoint. And I think it's important for anyone that's in the creative field to know that. Uh, many a times we are unaware of it and uh, most of the times uh, the critics are right and we are wrong. Um, in such situations, when you feel that they've been unfair, cut that criticism out from the piece of paper, stick it on your bathroom wall, and every morning look into the mirror and say, one day, buddy, I'm going to disprove you. <laughs> wisdom and remaining silent. And uh, Judge, I want to sh thank you for showing the strength it takes in speaking up because these are the two fundamental things I have been learning to learn from both of you. Um, I also wanted to give you my book, may I? I have I've got the book I've read. And you've kept it from me, so no, that's okay. No, Judge, it's back. <laughs> I've given it to my sister to read it. She read it and she's brought it back. <laughs> I don't really remember. <laughs> uh, may I please invite you to give this book a blessing? Actually, I'm not so sorry. You know, you're, I started out in the evening with, with you know, bringing my ancestors in. Is there a line of your dad's poetry that would serve as a blessing as you share this book with, with the rest of the world? Is there something that comes to you that's appropriate that feels like blessing? So that all our ancestors will be up and smile.
really don't know. I can't really say I died without the entire person. I don't remember the entire poem. But I was talking earlier on about how uh, sometimes uh, my father would ask me to uh, read some of the poems that he had written and explain to me the graph of the poem. So there was a poem that he wrote on on the on the kind of uh, the rush of life that we all go through, and he wrote जीवन की आपत अभी में कब वक्त मिला कुछ देर कहीं पर बैठ कभी ये सोच सकते जो किया कहा माना उसमें क्या पता था जिस दिन मेरी चेतना जगी मैंने देखा मैं खड़ा हुआ इस दुनिया के मेले में हर एक यहाँ पर एक भुलावे में भूला हर एक लगा है अपनी अपनी देहे में कुछ देर रहा हक्का पक्का बहुत चक्का सा आ गया कहाँ क्या करूँ यहाँ जाऊँ किस जहाँ फिर एक तरफ से आया ही तो थक्का सा मैंने भी पहना शुरू किया इस रेले में सो लाइफ इज सेट उस एक रेला है एक मेला है जीव But these are the lines. It's okay to recite them. But what he actually made me understand was, and many a times a poet writes an expression, and through words actually gives it some kind of physicality. So if this first line were to be read the way he had written it to explain the rush of life, it would be something like this: "The jeevan ki apa dhapi me kab vakt mila kuch deer kahi par baith kabi ye soch sakun jo ki aka."